My name is Michael Chapman. I'm two kinds of uh, medical doctor. I'm what's called a geriatrician, who's a doctor for people as they get older, and a palliative care specialist. I'm the director of palliative care here at uh, Canberra Hospital. I'm Tracy Gillard. I'm the CEO of Palliative Care ACT, which is an advocacy and volunteer organisation here in Canberra. We're here today to address some of the questions that consumers have provided through Healthcare Consumers Association of the ACT for World Cancer Day in February. The first question is, what is palliative care? Thanks, Tracy. A really, really important question. When I, uh, there's lots of different answers to that, and but when I talk to patients and families about palliative care, uh, I tend to say that for anybody who's got some kind of advanced illness or an illness that you can't necessarily take away altogether, mm-hmm. palliative care are all the things we do to make sure each day is as good as it can be. Mm-hmm. And that's really the kind of the heart of it. There's probably a number of different kind of core elements to you know what that means uh, palliative care is is care that's really focused on what's important to the person and making sure that that everything that can be done to you know provide for uh, you know days that are that are of best comfort and and exactly the kind of quality that that person finds important is are being provided it's care that's um, holistic conscious that there's all kinds of elements about um, you know how I am and when I'm well or when I'm sick that are important for to make my days as good as it can be and that things like for instance my physical comfort like pain control and other things like it might be really important but there might be lots of other things that are important as well so palliative care is holistic in sort of trying to make sure we're working on all of those things it also recognizes that while Caring for a single person with an illness is important. There are lots of other people around that person that also require care and support. Mm. So it's sort of care for communities or networks, not just individual people. And it's a care that anticipates rather than just responds, meaning that it's not just a care where we wait for a problem to happen Mm. and then do something about it. It's something where we try and talk and think and plan around what sort of problems might come up and make sure we've got as good a plan as we possibly can to, to keep those things controlled, if and when they do occur. Mm, that's a great differentiation to other areas of medicine where you know, you're looking at it to, um, in advance of what might happen. So further on from, from that description, which is a really well-rounded description, when does somebody decide they might need palliative care? Yeah, thanks. Another good question. And um, I think... There's a couple of parts to my answering this. And I think the first thing is around the who decides, you know, because mm. you said um, your, the way you frame that question is when, you know, does a person decide that they, they, they need palliative care? And I, I think that's really important, actually, that um, at its heart, um, you know, we work in a healthcare system which, which often revolves around healthcare providers deciding what type of care and providing referral to other Mm. healthcare providers. But actually palliative care is really about a person or a person's family really deciding that this is important for them. And so that's a really valid route to receive palliative care support, not just because a clinician has provided a Mm. referral. Okay, so that would be the first point. Mm. The when of that, again, is, is an important thing. So historically, when palliative care was sort of first came about as a, um, as a sort of a type of healthcare, palliative care was often thought about as something that was provided um, when a person was very sick and maybe even when they were quite close to dying of a sort of a serious illness. More and more, though, we've understood that for, for us to be able to really positively influence a person's care in all sorts of different ways, actually the best time to get palliative care is as early as you can. Mm. And the best evidence for this internationally is really around that if a person receives a diagnosis of an illness that is an illness that's difficult to take away, a serious advanced illness, like for instance, an advanced cancer, that actually um, thinking about a palliative approach to care as part of what's being provided from the point of diagnosis is actually really important. Mm. A key consideration for that, though, or a key clarification, is that that doesn't mean that you're not doing all the other stuff as well. It doesn't mean that we're saying that you shouldn't be getting, for instance, all manners of appropriate treatments and surgeries or whatever it might be to treat something like an advanced cancer. But in addition to that, 
a focus on quality, a focus on comfort, a focus on what's really important is, is an important thing to provide as well. And I suspect that's where a lot of people have a different understanding to what we're talking about as being palliative care because traditionally it's been known as end-of-life care. Palliative yeah. care is really at the end, whereas we're talking about introducing it much earlier so that no matter what the outcome is of a, a serious illness, you get that style of treatment throughout the, the, the pathways that you take. Yeah, it's, mm. it's so true, Tracy. And, you know, and I, I think that we're only just realising the kind of, the, 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 you know, the breadth of the benefits of doing that, of having that kind of care introduced early into a patient, a person's journey. You know, we know now that, you know, if a person gets this focus of palliative care in addition to all the other types of care that they should, you know, at the point of having this kind of diagnosis of an advanced illness, that their control of their physical symptoms is better, mm. that communication and understanding of what the future might be like is improved, the care for, for families and for those around the person is improved, but also from some studies, people may actually even live longer from having that kind of care as part of a component of their care. Mm. So there's all sorts of really important benefits, and that's the reason why we talk about it. So that's, that's actually a much broader definition of palliative care than I think most people will be used to. So what are the systems in place to support somebody once they're in palliative care? I guess the first thing is to recognise that um, I'm a palliative care specialist. My job is to provide this kind of care, but palliative care doesn't necessarily mean that you're seeing a palliative care specialist to get this kind of flavour of this care. Most palliative care is actually provided by people who are not, don't describe themselves as palliative care specialists, doctors, nurses, you know, physiotherapists, allied health workers, but people who are the people who are routinely providing care to patients and families who are now also doing that with this focus on comfort and quality. Does that make sense? <laughs> so I guess to, to say that again, to um, the systems in place to provide palliative care for a particular person, the first part of it may actually be the people that they're all, you're already seeing for your care. Mm -hmm. It might be, for instance, your GP. It might be if you have a problem with like a cancer-related diagnosis, your oncologist or radiation oncologist or cancer nurse specialist may also be may also all be part of the kind of first part of providing this palliative focus of care. So it sounds like that the person with the illness um, is is fundamental to being able to provide good palliative care because it's something that they need to be aware of and essentially ask for as part of their multifaceted treatment regime and the different people that they're engaging with. I think that's really true. I mean, I think as clinicians, we also have a responsibility and certainly a, um, a sort of a, a knowledge that we need to also bring this up and ask about these things mm -hmm. as well. But I think as well, you know, the sen this, how central the person, the person with the diagnosis is to palliative care also comes down to, for us to be, if, if palliative care is all about things like, you know, comfort and quality, what comfort and quality might mean to one person mm. is very different from another. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, it really is central to us to really understand what those things mean for that person, for us to provide that kind of care. Mm. So they really are central to it. Mm. And I suppose the other, other people that are central to it are those closest to the patient. So you often have a person in their life who will be an advocate or be present mm. with them at some of the clinical uh, meetings and things that they might have so that person is almost somebody who would be with them and pr uh, expecting a palliative care approach but only yeah too true and again you know so as we um, mentioned in when we we're defining what palliative care is recognizing that these close people these people that are really important you know in our lives um, they also have a tremendous impact on the day-to-day -day quality and comfort that we tend to experience when we're unwell. And so good palliative care to care for the person with the illness also needs to care for these other people because these other people have such an important care role for that, 
that person with the illness as well. One of the other consumer questions that we've had come through Healthcare Consumers Association ACT was around advanced care planning. Mm. And it's almost a good segue to go from the people around and the care. Can you tell us a little bit more about advanced care planning and how that comes into the palliative space? That's another important question. So advanced care planning, many, uh, many people may have heard this term before, but not be completely clear on what it means. To me, advanced care planning is all about the notion of, um, of us having a voice in saying what's important to us. Um, if and when uh, we get sick, and it's more difficult for us to express what's important to us then. We, you know, we all have different levels of comfort with these ideas, but um, I, I'm, a, I'm a mortal human being, you know. At some point, I'm going to, be, uh, going to be sicker than I am now. And there may be choices, healthcare choices that come up at that point that, that are actually really important choices. But if I'm sick in a way that it's difficult for me to be able to participate in those conversations, choices that I may not necessarily be able to have a voice in. Mm. Advanced care planning is about empowering people to be able to contribute to those conversations mm. by thinking about and talking through with the people who, who we really need to what's important to us well before we need to have mm. a decision about them to make sure those things are known. Mm. And so the advanced care planning to me is really involves conversation and thinking it can also involve documentation and that might be writing down the kind of key ideas from that mm. sometimes that's a document that's called an advanced care plan which might be um, uh, sort of a description of the sorts of things that are important to us and the sorts of decisions we think we would make in these situations and sometimes it can also include a kind of a legally binding document that's sometimes termed an advanced care directive Advanced care directives differ a little bit depending on what state or territory you might live in. And so really for anyone who's watching this who wants to know a little bit more about the specifics for wherever they are, I'm looking on a site like Advanced Care Planning Australia to get some sense of exactly what applies for you would be a, a good good way forward. Being in the space myself, working in, the, in, in palliative care, often say to my husband he should have a palliative care um, plan, mm -hmm. uh, an advanced care directive yeah. or, or advanced care plan, and he says, "Oh no, people know what I want. You know, it's it's I, I, I tell people, and so you know, there, I guess there's a risk that um, others may not have heard the latest. Yeah. <laughs> um, so so it's in many cases important to have that written down. Yeah, I, I agree, and I think you know the other point that you make there is that. Um, we all often assume that you know people know what's important to us, particularly if they're uh, they you know people that are close to us. And you know, um, actually, the evidence would suggest that's probably not true. Um, mm. That that people don't necessarily know as confidently as we might think the choices we might make if if you know our healthcare needs were to change. Um, and as you say, you know, even if we're in the absolute best of health. That doesn't mean we're always going to be like that, you know, in that situation. And so spending the time to, to whatever degree it's helpful, having these conversations, thinking these through is a really important sort of um, investment, you mm. know, for ourselves, mm. for that potential moment in the future. Mm. Mm. There are some wonderful resources as well on websites, say, um, called uh, Dying to Talk, which is uh, um, uh, run by uh, Palliative Care Australia. Mm. Uh, which is a website that sort of really empowers us to say, you know, that these these are tricky conversations to have and difficult ones to start and gives us a bit of an idea about how we can actually start talking through or thinking this through by ourselves or with other people. Mm. So, you know, if anyone um, has a few moments, you know, maybe checking out that website would be a good place to start. Yeah, absolutely. And um, in Palliative Care ACT, we've recently um, put out a publication called Palliative Caring, for mm. carers, which describes a lot of the process that they might go through too, which we are having a lot of take up. I think a lot of people are finding that very informative because it's not something we talk about. Michael, you were talking about uh, systems in place with palliative care, and I think we covered off very well the generalist mm. palliative care. Are there specialised palliative care? You said you were a specialist yourself. 
Can you elaborate on that? There is. And I guess the shortest answer for that is to say that um, regardless of where you might be, what, in terms of you might be at home or in a hospital or, or somewhere in an aged care facility, mm. there, there uh, should be a specialist palliative care service that you have access to through some mechanism. That differs a little bit state and territory or depending on where your jurisdiction, hence the slight vagaries of my language. Uh, specialist palliative care often often looks like a combination of things like uh, uh, hospital services where if a person's in a hospital then they can be visited by a specialist palliative care team or admitted to a, a specialist palliative care ward. It can look like specialist palliative care clinics or for people who are in the community. Mm -hmm. There's a thing called a uh, home-based palliative care service which operates many places which can see people in their homes. There are also many uh, services that actually support people who have specialist palliative care needs in aged care facilities to um, make sure they're getting the right care that's required. And there are also palliative care hospitals which historically used to be called hospices um, scattered around um, Australia and surrounding regions which again provide an inpatient um, focus of care for people who really need that, that kind of care. And I know um, from the research that I've read, a lot of people, of course, would prefer to stay in their own homes as long as they possibly can. And, um, and there are support services to enable that to happen. And often, as is the case, people become so sick that they don't have the equipment and the, the needs that they can at home. But how do people stay in their homes longer these days, Michael? Hey, is there any um, advice you would give people who want to do that? I think in terms of advice, the, I think the first thing is is probably, if that's an important priority, um, to, to talk to talk about that early mm -hmm. and so we can do as much planning as, as possible. Being staying at home if we've got an advanced illness and we've, we're close to dying, for instance, that's an incredibly important thing and can be just an absolutely wonderful thing for, for the person and for their family to be involved and be able to sort of really achieve that and provide mm -hmm. that kind of care. Mm -hmm. But it's a really challenging time too. And, you know, there can be a lot of complexities and a lot of needs to that. And so doing as much as we can to try and plan for things um, beforehand mm -hmm. is excellent. There are and lots of different services that can, uh, can uh, provide different types of support depending on what's required. And so there can be services that provide for the kind of physical aids and needs that we might have. Like for instance, we may need things like oxygen at home or mm -hmm. hospital bed or things like that. Mm -hmm. There may be clinical services. And I mentioned home-based palliative care as a kind of a specialist service that can often in reach into a person's home to provide additional care, which is often around the clock. There can be um, services from uh, GPs and, and other community-based services that can have a role in providing for um, expert um, care. Mm -hmm. But as um, said before, these services do differ a little bit um, in different states and territories. So mm -hmm. I'd recommend anyone watching this video to um, contact uh, your, there will be a palliative care organisation, which for us is Palliative Care ACT, obviously here at Canberra, uh, but uh, for your local jurisdiction and, and checking in with them about what services are available will be a really sensible next step. And really important for people in Canberra and the surrounding regions because we're so close to state borders, so it's, it's critical I understand the differences between New South Wales and, and the ACT regulations and laws. Yeah, a really important point. Um, Michael, I know how precious your time is and, and the people that you see throughout the day really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for making the time to talk to me today about palliative care. It's such an important issue, important for you, important for me and important for every human being. So I really appreciate your time. Sure. Well, thanks, thanks for the opportunity. Mm. Enjoy it.